Hello everyone, my name is Chrissy and welcome to my channel. Now hopefully I do not have too nasally of a voice or too raspy of a voice because I have been sick for the last week with a sinus infection that kind of laid me out for a couple days. But that's all right, I'm back. It's fine, it's fine. Got medications for it, it's fine, it's fine. Now we're going to cover Battle Royale chapters 41 through chapter 60. And now we're in chapter 41, where we have Shuya, Noriko, and Kawada actually make it to the clinic that they were aiming for. Now, the shaky diagnosis that Noriko may have is sepsis. Is there a definite thing that she has it? No, Kawada's making his best guess at that. But they find medicines in this clinic. Kawada picks one out that will help with sepsis and actually gives Noriko an injection to help her with that. A little bit, my suspension of disbelief was kind of shaken in this scene. I don't really, I can't really pinpoint why that is because so far we've get, been given hints that Kawada has certain medical abilities to be able to treat things. Uh, he is the one who has been bandaging Noriko up and doing stitches and all that kind of stuff. So it really shouldn't surprise me that he is able to give injections and to figure out what medicines will help with sepsis. But it was just kind of weird. I was like, he's just... He just has so much knowledge. I, I do wonder if he really got this from a relative or whether he looked this stuff up after he went to the hospital. I do also wonder if he had sepsis after his battle royale and whether the nurses treated him at the hospital for that while he was in there. That would make sense to me if that is what happened, uh, but we're not really sure. It's not really explained in the books. However, the more I'm thinking about it, the more that makes sense. In chapter 42, Kawada kind of leaves Noriko to rest and he goes scrounging the clinic for food. At that point, Shuya and Kawada kind of talk about the callers a little bit, how they work, and they talk a little bit about Yoshitoki and how he and Shuya grew up in the same place. And once again, we get conversations of, who do you like? Kawada asks Shuya who he likes, and it's... I'm getting that he's trying to point to Noriko and be like, you two smooch it out. I don't know. It seems like Kawada is trying to get his OTP to kind of hash it out. But it's kind of just them conversing while they're looking for food at this point. So chapter 43 follows Shinji and Yutaka, and Shinji happens to be one of my favorite characters of this whole book, mainly because he is very bright, and he figures out that the devices around their necks, the collars around their necks, are listening devices. So after he works that out in his brain of why his, you know, um, virus plan with the computer didn't work out, he figures out, oh, well, there has to be some way, oh, these things, they're listening devices. And so then he starts communicating with Yutaka through written language. This is where it got really interesting for me as far as language goes, because we get this translation and Shinji's trying to communicate with Yutaka, and then he keeps thinking back, oh, I don't know the kanji for this. So he has to kind of make his best estimation. And I just thought that was a neat tie-in to have. There's so much to learn as far as kanji goes and the written language uh, for Japan that sometimes it just gets really complicated. So Shinji has to think of ways around that. So does Yutaka when he has to start writing back to Shinji. The bulk of this chapter is them talking about how they're going to bomb the school where Sakamochi is. They manage to figure out where certain supplies are and find workarounds of how to get those supplies as well as figuring out how to get those bombs to that forbidden zone where the school sits. So that's what this chapter is all about. It's a pretty long chapter because they're writing back and forth and they're trying to detail all of their plans uh, to escape. So chapter 44 comes around and we follow a character named Sho. Now Sho is the last of Kiriyama's lackeys. Sho did not meet up with Kiriyama at the beginning, so he was not killed by Kiriyama at the beginning. So one thing to note with Sho as well is he is a gay character. Um, keep in mind that Japan is not known for its tolerance of, of people who identify as LGBTQ. And also this book was written about 20 years ago. So keeping that in mind with Sho's character, I actually think he's kind of progressive a little bit as far as Japan's culture goes. And we look at him through an American lens, he is not progressive as a character at all. Like it's, 
<laughs> but as far as taking culture and time into consideration, I actually think Sho is kind of a shocking character to have in Battle Royale. Sho as a character is very cunning, he's very clever, uh, but he's also very, very self-centered. He, the reason why he didn't meet, didn't meet up with Kiriyama is because he was like, I remember for himself at that point. So this chapter is him following Kiriyama. Um, he decided that his best chance was to follow the person he thinks is going to end up winning the game, and he thinks that's Kiriyama. So he follows Kiriyama since Kiriyama killed off the rest of uh, their group. So he's been following him from a distance and that kind of thing. The plan is for Kiriyama to kill everyone, and then while Kiriyama's not looking, to kill him and to be the winner of this thing. Kiriyama continues to just kind of go his path. Sho notices that they're right now in an area that's going to be forbidden shortly, but he's not too worried about that because he thinks Kiriyama is, you know, a smart enough guy that if he needs to book tail, then he's going to book tail. And he follows Kiriyama to this bathroom. Now, Kiriyama goes in and Sho from the distance kind of hears him going to the bathroom because the door's semi open, not a lot, but just like a peek. Um, and he's just waiting for Kiriyama to come out. He takes a look at his watch. He's like, wow, it's like five minutes until we have to kind of beat it out of here. But it's fine. It's fine. It'll be fine. He keeps hearing the pee going on. At that point, he's like, what's going on here? Like, this is a, this is a very long time. Like, this is, this is unacceptable. Then he notices that the wind kind of picks up and opens the door. And Kiriyama is not in the bathroom. In fact, Kiriyama had tied a water bottle up to the ceiling and uh, poked a hole in it so that water was coming out. He had snuck out of the bathroom and Sho does not get enough time to get out of the forbidden zone before, before time's up. So his head boom, explodes out of there, which is a shame. I actually like Sho as a character. I kind of hope that he <laughs> had lasted a little bit longer. I thought his characterization was pretty good, but... Chapter 45 rolls around and Shuya, Noriko, and Kawada are eating um, and they find rice. And then, of course, Noriko tells Shuya that a lot of girls liked him. There's not really a lot going on in that chapter. So we get to chapter 46 where Hirono is actually suffering from sepsis, but she does not know that. Uh, instead, she's looking for water. She, she runs into another character named Toshinori, who has a belt in his hand. Noriko shoots at him and shoots him in the chest, uh, and she thinks that she, you know, killed him, and she goes to go get his water. Little does she know, Toshinori has a bulletproof vest on, and he chokes her with the belt. Chapter 47 comes around, and we have Shinji again and Yutaka, and they figured out a way to get the bomb over the school with helium trash bag balloons ish and this chapter is just them setting the plans in motion so hopefully it goes well uh chapter 48 comes around and kawada notices that someone's kind of rustling around outside he tells everyone to get down and it ends up being hiroki who has the pda apparently the pda lets him find other people he stays for just a little bit, but he tells them that ultimately he's looking for another student named Kayoko. He's looking for her. She hasn't died yet, so he's continuing his search. He doesn't explain why he's looking for her, but I have a feeling it has to do with liking someone. That's going to be my guess. If it's anything other than that, I'll be surprised. But that's my guess. He ends up leaving and continuing his search. Now, they actually um, tell him a means for him to get back to them. Uh, Kawada shows him this like bird whistle that he'll keep blowing on until, you know, he can find them. So that if he does want to team up, then he can. Chapter 49 and the three, um, Shuya, Noriko, and Kawada have to leave the clinic because it's going to become a forbidden zone and they have to find a new place. They are just talking strategy as they leave and they're going around. At the end of this chapter, Shuya notices something coming towards them in the air. Chapter 50 comes around and we find out it's a grenade. Now Shuya, like a true action star, actually manages to jump, grab a grenade and hurl it at whoever was throwing it at them or away from them. And it turns out to be Kiriyama who finds them. Now, there's an epic gun battle that happens uh, between Kawada, Shuya, and Kiriyama. While that's happening, they're noticing that Kiriyama is, you know, gaining 
distance on them, so any time that they have to reload weapons or anything, Kiriyama's getting closer and closer. And Chia thinks, well, I'm faster than the other two. So if anything else, I have a better chance of escaping. So he has Kawada and Noriko run for it while he gives them cover. So that way he can meet up with them later. And he tells them that he'll meet up with them back at a previous spot that they had been in. At some point he has Kiriyama pinned with gunfire and he was like, this is my chance to run. And so he runs, he runs, gets shot in the back a couple times and then he falls and blacks out. And that's where that chapter ends. Chapter 51 comes around and we are back to Shinji and Yutaka. They are about ready to set off a bomb on the school. They have their balloons ready. They have the bomb ready. They have their pulley system that they worked out ready. They're ready. But then it all gets effed up. Because another classmate and who was friends with Shinji and Yutaka, uh, Kieta, comes around. Shinji pulls out his gun and points it at Kieta. Now, Shinji's history with Kieta comes into play with this chapter, and Shinji remembers a moment back in time when Kieta and him were at this music store. Shinji left uh, for some reason and ends up getting jumped in this alleyway. Now, he notices that Kieta had actually saw him get jumped, but then turned around and walked away, and Shinji kind of held that inside. So this is really good look at how fear and mistrust and past deeds can really, you know, mess with a person when they're in these kind of stressful environments. Because Shinji seems like a really reasonable guy uh, for the most part, except for when it comes to this scene right here. It's kind of the, his downfall that he is holding on a little bit to this grudge and making it his reason not to trust who a person who used to be his friend. Unfortunately, Shinji just doesn't think things through and he shoots Kieta. Yutaka doesn't really understand. Uh, he and Shinji have a moment of arguing slash talking. And then Kiriyama shows up. Of course that mofo does. He shows up, he finds them, and he starts shooting at Yutaka and Shinji. They have this gunfight and Shinji ends up deciding that he's going to use his bomb to try and kill Kiriyama uh, to save both him and Yutaka. He tries to blow him up and it ends up being where Kid it misses Kiriyama and Kiriyama shoots and kills Shinji. I was really surprised by this chapter and that that's how that ended because I really thought Shinji was going to be one of the ones to meet up with Shuya af after all and that they would actually, you know, make it to the end. At then it just didn't happen. Did not happen. I was very shocked how that played out. It was actually a very good scene uh, as far as, you know, Shinji trying his best and unfortunately Kiriyama just getting the upper hand on him. Uh, chapter 52 is Kawada and Noriko waiting for Shinji and just that Noriko's worried. They haven't heard from him. It's been a long time since he uh, has shown up. Chapter 53 comes around and it follows Hiroki and he sees this kind of blur or this figure run at him and it turns out to be Mitsuko. And he ends up dodging and tripping Mitsuko so that she drops her gun. Hiroki picks it up and it looks like he's about to hand it to her. Uh, but then he flips it around and lets her know that he ran into Takako and he knows what she did. Unfortunately, Hiroki just cannot pull the trigger. And I say unfortunately. Is it really unfortunately though? He's a very kind person and that he doesn't want to shoot anyone. He really just doesn't have it in him to do it. So he can't really shoot her. Mitsuko ends up stabbing him, um, I believe in the shoulder, and then running the hell away. Chapter 54 comes around and Hiroki runs into Toshinori, who has his bulletproof vest. He also has a helmet and it's like this mini tirade he goes on mentally about how, you know, there's plebs, like people who are poor don't deserve things and that these girls just like guys who are good looking. He is the quintessential nice guy. He's like an incel. It was kind of shocking to have that kind of character, but he's there. He runs into Hikori and Hikori manages to get away from him, but then he gets shot by Kiriyama after uh, trying to bear his grounds and he tries to play dead on the ground, but he doesn't realize that Kiriyama makes sure that the people he kills is killed and he ends up coming and uh, shooting Toshinori many, many times in the head to make sure that he's dead. Uh, chapter 55 comes around, uh, Mitsuko runs across 
a student named Tadakatsu who is using the bathroom um, and she sees him and she thinks now is the perfect opportunity to kill him. And she has her scythe out and she's about ready to go and kill him when she gets caught by another character named uh, Yuichiro. And Yuichiro kind of, you know, he's like, what is going on up in here? Tadakatsu turns around, realizes that Mitsuko had her scythe out and realizes she was going to kill him. She manages to convince Yuichiro she just wanted to talk. I didn't have my scythe out. I wasn't going to chop chop a mofo. I just wanted to talk. Yuichiro falls for it. And he talks with Tadakatsu and they decide that they're just going to tie her up and that they will take her as captive. So chapter 56 rolls around and we have Tadakatsu... Uh, who takes the first sleep. So Mitsuko and Yuichiro are the ones who are kind of keeping watch. Really, it's Yuichiro who's keeping watch and Mitsuko who's kind of keeping in company. He unties her bonds and lets her drink water. And this is like the first time that Mitsuko kind of actually feels something for someone. Uh, And it's a small amount of feeling, but she feels it. It rolls into chapter 57 in the same vein. Tadakatsu wakes up and it's his turn to take watch. So Yuchiro falls asleep, and while Yuchiro is asleep, Mitsuko decides that she was going to seduce Tadakatsu to try and kill him. Unfortunately, she did not plan her attacks too thoroughly because Tadakatsu figures out what she's about to do and fights back. Yuichiro wakes up uh, while he hears this noise, and he's like, what the hell is going on up in here? Tadakatsu tries to tell him, you know, she's trying to kill me. I've been telling you all along. And Mitsuko is like, he just tried to force himself on me. At that point, Tadakatsu tries to shoot Mitsuko. In fact, he pulls a move that's similar to Hiroki at one point where he, it looks like he's about to hand over the gun to Yuichiro, but then he turns it around in his hand and tries to shoot Mitsuko. Yuichiro, however, dodges in front of the bullet and gets killed trying to save Mitsuko. Mitsuko then takes that opportunity to kill Tadakatsu. Then we get to chapter 58, which uh, goes from Mitsuko to Shuya. And Shuya is dreaming uh, that he's back in his classroom. And then that dream quickly turns into a nightmare when all his classmates are, you know, dead. He wakes up and then he is facing Yuki, who was the class leader. This rolls into chapter 59, which we have Yuki and Shuya, and they talk about their collective experience. So Yuki tells him about how she gathered these other five girls to come and have an alliance with her, and they got into this lighthouse, while Shuya tells her all the events that have happened since he left the school, including him killing um, Oki, who was the guy who got the axe to the face. Unfortunately for Shuya, one of the girls who saw that happen, or rather saw the aftermath of it, of Shuya trying to get the axe back from Oki, from Oki's face, is there in that tower as well. Chapter 60, we get Yuko, who is the one who saw Shuya and Oki, um, and Shuya pulling the axe out of her classmate's head. And she thinks Shuya is too dangerous to stay here. He's got to go. But at the same time, she's also thinking, however, he's probably mortally wounded enough to where I don't have to worry about. Other things will take care of him. And then unfortunately that dream is not realized because Yuki comes down and lets them all know that Shuya is awake. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I love this book. Like, it's really good. It does annoy me a little bit that there's a lot going on of, so who do you like? So, are you dating? That kind of thing goes on in a constant basis. However, I do think that it's meant to kind of bring drama into this piece, even more so than there already is. I think it's a way to kind of put even more on the line for these kids. I don't think it's necessary, though. That's my one complaint about this entire novel, is that I wish there wasn't so much of this, you know, who do you like? Are they dead? The only reason why I care if they're alive is because I had a crush on them. That kind of seems to be like this ongoing thing that happens. Otherwise, I think this is really well done. We get a lot of look into the characters, even the ones who we only know for a chapter. I think there's a lot built into their personality for those chapters. Like the chapter with Sho was just amazing. I loved his character and I wish that he had survived. But unfortunately, he didn't. I was actually sad. And he I only got to know him for one chapter. But in that one chapter, it kind of cemented his personality for me. And I thought that that was a great thing for the 
author to be able to do. So have you read these chapters? Have you read Battle Royale? Let me know down in the comments below what you think. What do you think of this constant who do you like scenarios and constant talk about the, that subject? Let me know down in the comments. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button. If you like seeing this face talk about books, hit that subscribe button. And as always and forever, may you get lost in a book.